I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Welcome to today's program, which will explore the experiences of people with disabilities under Nazism, a diverse group of people that is far too often left out of the narratives that we tell about exclusion and persecution, both during the Holocaust and here in the United States. We have two esteemed and deeply knowledgeable guests with us to explore the subject. Dr. Edith Sheffer is a prize-winning historian uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. Her 2018 book, Asperger's Children, The Origins of Autism in Nazi Vienna, tells part of the story we're going to explore today. It's a stunning expose of Nazi doctor, Dr. Hans Asperger, uh, and it's well worth reading. You can order the book at the link in the Zoom chat. Just a moment. Uh, in conversation with Edith is our host, Dr. Tim Schreiber, a lifelong educator and disability rights activist who serves as chairman of the Special Olympics. As Edith and Tim get into their discussion and presentation, please feel free to share questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we'll try to get to as many as we can towards the end of the hour together. Without further ado, thank you again to all of you for being here. Welcome, Tim and Edith. Tim, feel free to get us started. Thanks. Thank you, Ari. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks, everyone. Looks like you have a wonderful crowd here of people interested. It's so affirming, honestly, uh, for me to be not just with Edith, but with so many people who care about the issues that we're going to talk about today. It has been for in, in most cultures and in most times in history, a subject around which very few people have interest. Uh, and I, people often ask me, what's the biggest challenge facing people with intellectual developmental disabilities like autism today? I always have the same answer, negative attitudes and indifference. That's our biggest opponent. Here we gather with people who are not indifferent uh, and with people who are open-minded and with people who want to learn and with people who care uh, that we understand deeply uh, and that we remember and that we bring our remembrances and our understanding to our daily lives. No one better equipped to help launch this conversation than Professor Sheffer uh, uh, already You've heard about her work, her teaching. Um, she has uh, begun to peel back the layers of the onion in a uh, painful but essential way around the role of uh, the Nazi uh, uh, Holocaust leaders uh, in, their, in, the, in the creation of and the development of and the advancement of a eugenics field that uh, continues to work subtle uh, negative energy in our country and in the world today. So we are not here, uh, I would argue, just to talk about history. We are here to talk about the effect history has on us right now. But without further delay and with deep gratitude, I wanna hand it over to Professor Sheffer and let her take us through some of the findings in her very important recent book and uh, get the conversation started so we can all join in. Edith, over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ari and Tim, for the kind introduction. We thought that we'd begin today by just giving an overview of what happened in the Nazi period. This is um, the fate of people with disabilities as a lesser known chapter, as Ari and, and Tim had said, and I just wanted to start by giving some background. So Ari, we can start with the next slide. So the Third Reich above all sought to create a unified national community. And as we know, the Holocaust, the extermination of 6 million Jews and other populations deemed undesirable. Part of this was I, the idea of eugenics, upbreeding the parts of the population that were deemed desirable and excluding those with disabilities who were deemed to be uh, contaminating the gene pool or a drain on financial resources. And you can see this asylum on the bottom, the slide says life without hope. Um, next slide. So this began the persecution of people with disabilities with forced sterilization. Tim can speak to this in the United States as well. The Nazis drew a lot of inspiration from what was happening here. And um, the circle of people that were deemed hereditarily ill was a constantly expanding category um, from schizophrenia to Huntington's to um, epilepsy, different kinds of disabilities, but also it would then encircle people who were deemed um, to be work shy or have problems with alcohol. 
In the end, almost half a million people were forcibly sterilized, about 400,000. So the next slide. In July 1939, the Nazi big regime began its first program of mass murder, and this predates the Holocaust. It was the decision to kill children under three who were seen to be born with defects. And unlike other programs of Nazi killing, this was to be legal. They were working on a law, and this was to become a permanent part of the healthcare system, kind of an extension of abortion, if you want to think of it like that. This was not something to be hidden. Um, but something very much out in the open. Next slide. This expanded then, again, we're still in 1939, to the killing of adults who were deemed to be disabled. And this was a much larger operation. In contrast to the killing of children, the killing of children was meant, as I said, to be a, a public health issue and children were supposed to have purportedly scientific files and um, they were screened. The killing of adults with disabilities was really a mass emptying of asylums. And you can see here that they were killed in um, gas chambers in crematoria. And um, the, there were six killing centers inside the Reich. It was widely known what was happening and people could smell the stench of ashes in their daily life. This is something we can talk about in the discussion, but there was widespread protest and resistance to this movement. And as we all know, there wasn't to the killing of Jews. And um, to the point where it was openly discussed, there were leaflets distributed and Hitler shut down this program, the T4 program in August, 1941. Uh, the personnel who'd invented the technology for the gas chambers of crematoria were sent east to implement this technology on extermination camps um, against Jews. But this technology was invented for the purpose of killing people with disabilities. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to concentrate on uh, the killing of children because I think it's an underrepresented um, side to the, the Nazi killing um, programs. Whereas the killing of people with adults was indiscriminate and in a lot of ways, um, you know, reminiscent of what happened with other populations. It was about a quarter of a million adults were killed. Um, the child euthanasia program uh, victimized between five and 10,000 children. And these children were, uh, cared for by women. This wasn't the kind of mass selections that you saw at the extermination camps. These nurses knew their ward's names. They changed their sheets. They fed them daily. This is a very intimate kind of killing. And they would um, uh, sprinkle barbiturates into the food that the children ate and um, or inject barbiturates into the children. And so they grew weaker or um, contracted diseases like pneumonia. So it would look to be a natural cause of death. Um, but in fact, it was hastened by the medicine that, that these nurses were giving. Next slide, please. And so um, as Ari and Tim mentioned my work, I think it's really important to realize how deeply uh, the euthanasia program penetrated the medical community. I wrote a book about Dr. Hans Asperger, who's famous, of course, for developing the autism uh, diagnosis that we still use today. And um, I uncover his role in this network. He did not work at a killing center himself, but he transferred children who he deemed undesirable and ineducable to these centers. And so here are pictures of two children, Hertha Schreiber and Elizabeth Schreiber, who he um, transferred. And Hertha Schreiber um, was severely disabled from meningitis and diphtheria. And her mother is known to have said to the presiding doctor at Spiegelgrund, um, won't it be better if she should die as she has nothing to live for anyway? And Hertha was indeed put to death. And when you look at these files, um, you can see in fact that some parents requested their children be sent to killing centers. And there's evidence that Asperger himself was sensitive to these requests. And um, in the files, there are also thank you notes from some parents upon their children's death for, um, for having their children killed. Um, Elizabeth Schreiber, who's here, who Asperger also transferred, could speak a single word, mama, 
that she was known to repeat over and over again at the killing center. And she would cry and she would hug the nurse um, for comfort. Both children died within just a few months of Asperger's transfer. Next slide. Um, so this is a panel, of course, on, on disability, but the Nazi um, scrutiny of disability was ever more and more minute. So these are two girls that Asperger's tr clinic transferred um, that I, you know, he defined as asocial. They were um, running away from home and they were behavior problems at school. And um, both of these girls were, were transferred. It's seen to be unable to integrate with the broader community. And if you look at, um, you know, some of the records of these killing centers, about 10% of kids had no diagnoses at all. About um, three in five had amorphous diagnoses of imbecility or idiocy. So again, you know, really shows the subjectivity behind, you know, social constructions of what dis disability means. Okay, next slide. Um, unfortunately, the voices of these children have been lost over time. It was very stigmatized to have even been in an asylum, um, and a lot of these children were unable to speak for themselves. So unfortunately, we do not have a great record of their experiences. The documentation center um, in Vienna, the Center of Austrian Resistance conducted 12 interviews that are available online in English that I would recommend if you're interested in this topic to, to watch in full. They are harrowing and they just describe um, continuous brutality at these centers. Um, in addition to starvation, poor medical treatment, constant physical abuse, um, I'm gonna be showing a couple clips that these children will be discussing. They would be issued different forms of shots. There were vomit shots that would make you vomit. Um, there was the sulfur cure, uh, which would induce pain in you know, whatever appendage it was injected in for a couple of weeks. Um, let's go to the next slide and hear about the experiences of uh, Friedrich Gazzaro. Um, this is done of the old Dann haben sie die, die Wiegelkur gemacht, die war so groß. Ambulanzliege, zwei Tag, trockene Lenticke, zwei nasse Lenticke, Splitter noch da ausziehen. Und dann sind die Lenticke so zusammengeschlagen worden wie bei einer Mumme. Und überall bis da nur im Kopf haben sie freilassen. Ähm, überall abbunden worden mit so Gürteln. Und dann bis in der Zöhn ging, haben sie mich auf die Erde gelegt. Und ich habe nur auf dem Himmel auf, also auf dem Plafon aufgeschlagen. Ich habe mich Kinder nicht nach links dran, ich habe meine Kinder nach rechts dran. Für es nicht ausstrecken, für es nicht erziehen. Und das werden wir ja noch probieren. Wie lange sie in einem Peter aushalten, ohne dass er sich umdreht. Und da habe ich, da habe ich oft schon gesagt, ähm, also da habe ich wieder, ich habe eine Zeit dann zum Beten aufgehört, weil man denkt, hat, mir hilft eh niemand. Aber damals habe ich wieder angefangen. Und Und da habe ich noch ähm, um Verzeihung bitte, dass ich das so lange nicht gemacht habe, weil ich glaube, habe, es ist mir geholfen. Aber es ist mir nicht geholfen worden. Und wenn sie die ausgelassen haben, waren die Leute dich nie trocken. Ja, du bist in deinen eigenen Ring gehen. Und ganz grausam war das, wenn sie da jetzt durch das Wort zum Jucken angefangen hat. Und du hast es können nicht kratzen oder so. Und du hast es müssen ertragen. ertragen ähm, Bis das von selber angegangen ist, das war schon, das war schon eine, eine bestialische Sache, die sie dort gemacht haben. Schlemperkur genauso wie eiserne Bo Bodewanne, eiskühles Wasser, Owe, Apfel, Owe, Apfel, Owe, Apfel. Das gab es schon bald und das Stickste. Und warum sie das gemacht haben, weiß ich nicht. Aber sie haben mir eine Pflicht getan. Da wird sich der Führer gefreut haben. Okay, so um, the next survivor is going to describe his experiences um, in the killing pavilion um, where he was when he was about five or six years old. And you can see he's going to be describing a very sedated state where he's not even sure what's going on. 
the Vitana Re spritzen oder dort hat er eine gute Erinnerung, das hat er auch ein gefasst, dann bis drei Tage war er hier gewesen, das war damals ein richtiger Versuchskaninchen, da muss immer so ein Spritzen geben. Nun, oder wenn man, wenn man ein bisschen zu wirklich war, da war ein alter Kind ist, mache ich da ein bisschen lebhaft oder, oder so, wenn man schreit oder was, oder du schmerzt, nein, da war es irgendwas. Dann hat man halt ganz einfach mit so Beruhigungsspritzen Wurzel gespritzt haben, bevor die man eigentlich eh wurscht hat, sie haben was gespritzt und dann hat gesagt, es war wieder für eine, eine Ruhe. Und da ist halt dann uns und sie nicht schlecht gegangen. Und da sind halt einige, dann halt halt drauf gestorben. Und da muss ich schon sagen, also da, das ist schon. Das, durch das, weiß ich, das war aber, war halt nicht so, so kinderbereit ist, und dann auf einmal verschickt das eine oder das andere, da macht man halt Gedanken. So as you might imagine, these survivors also describe what life was like in the enduring trauma after the war. Um, here are some clips again from survivors, the next slide. Oh, forgive me. Um, children were also subjected to medical experiments. Um, there were known uh, tuberculosis vaccines that were tested on them, and then children would be put to death in order for their autopsies to be studied. Uh, this is a picture of Heinrich Gross, uh, who in Vienna harvested about 400 children's brains, um, and he published research on these brains up through the 1980s. And um, you know, body parts from the children at Spiegelgrund would be circulated among different medical labs in Vienna well after the war. Okay, next slide. And we'll get um, from Rudolf Karger what his post-war life was like. Also ich kann nicht ernst sagen, ich habe äh, das, wie das, wie das alles gefunden worden ist, meine Sachen da, und ich habe das durchgelesen, das war für mich eine Katastrophe. Ich habe ein Jahr nicht sprechen können. Ich habe mir so gezogen gehabt, ich habe mir trotzdem was gehört, weil, weil ich das nicht verstanden habe, dass man so gemein sein kann, uns dort hinschicken. Das haben sie zusammen schon ausgehört, dass man spielt und was da los ist, das ist die Vormundschaft. Und die, die, die Falschheit, was die, was ich, die ich über mich geschrieben haben und über meine Familie was gar nicht stimmt. Das hat mich furchtbar. Das, da war ich K.O. Ein Jahr war ich da K.O. Von Spülgrund kann man ja gar nicht reden, weil das so ein. Und dann der nächste Slide. Und immer die Frage bei jedem Menschen: Bist du für mich oder bist du gegen mich? Das war immer eine Überlebensfrage. Und das steht mir auch jetzt über irgendwo, wenn ich jemanden. Sie haben einen Kontakt, aber dafür auf welcher Seite steht der, welche Seite stand der damals und hätte die der geholfen, wenn du das gewusst hättest, oder hätte der mir nicht geholfen. Das sind diese Fragen, die immer wieder kommen, die einen mit nichts zu bringen. Ich bin auch niemand böse, man kann da nicht jemanden böse wenn das Böse so ohne Namen ist, wenn das Böse einfach das dazu gehört, wie das Leben dort. Wenn das Böse hat dazu gehört, das war der Alltag und das wurde einfach nie angezweifelt. Und das ist nicht richtig, warum machen die das und so ist es und das muss man durchstehen. Wenn ich mich nicht beobachte, sehe ich beim Gehen immer den Hals ein. Das hätte ich eh nicht Angst, dass mir jemand in den Nacken schlägt mit einem Stück oder so. Weil dieses Hals immer, auch wenn er sich dazu beginne, beginne ich die Schulter hochzuziehen, den Hals einzuziehen, um gewappnet zu sein beim ersten Stück. Dinge, wo ich nicht über den anderen gar nicht erwarten würde, dass ich überhaupt den ersten Schlag gekriegt habe. Ich suche diese Kinder zu nehmen, weil ich war ein verkrüppelter Mensch, Wahnsinn. Und das Kind, das Kind braucht nicht los. Ich bin ewig auf der Flucht. 
Ja bi imel bakar, samo ne bi želel biti špezljiv, sami put, nudljivo od resod, sajc, cukar, tudi zmeni eplec, in se dobro tudi eplec, jer en pilih pilice se pred cuhljivim. Ja bi imel cvet, kaj ni trokl, to veš imel. Se je bilo dalje zmeni en tizni bakar, da imel ne zmeni hvilec, da se bilo mogo kot je. Kot sem jih bila v javni zdrav, ki ne bi se gan se nare. Der Begriff und der das Leben, das ist, ist immer noch immer noch im Ohr. Das ist immer noch ein, ein Schild über mein Leben. Wo drauf steht, damit das Elka kann er nicht leben. Okay, and so the last slide. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to show these clips is because they are so rare. We are very lucky to have them. And as the survivors um, you know, move on through time, I would really put in a plea for trying to collect as many of these children's stories as possible. Um, it's, it's an angle of, of Nazi extermination that, that I said is, is very different from the kind of indiscriminate killing that was happening. And um, you know, the experience of, of children is something that's so important to understand. This has only become recognized and commemorated in, in recent years in Vienna. And um, I'm just happy today to be having this conversation to bear witness to these stories. Thank you. Um, I think it's, um, it's worth just taking a moment, uh, Edith, uh, thank you for, to thank you for, for doing the hard work to collect these, but maybe also for all of us, uh, 150 plus of us, just to um, let these, let the words you've shared with us and the words these survivors have shared with us sink in. Um, so if people are comfortable, I would just invite uh, a few seconds here now just of silence. If I may break in, I just saw a question that was posted that um, I think is important to answer. Was this only in Vienna? No. Um, my book is about Vienna and that was the second largest killing center, but um, the estimates is there were 37 special children's wards that, that were engaging in this kind of killing, 37. And this was inside the Reich. Many people knew what was happening. Um, this was kind of an open secret. So Edith, let me let me start, if I can, the questions a little bit with, in some ways, where, where you started. What can we learn from this history that we don't already know, uh, that's distinctive from what we know about the horrors of the Holocaust? What's What comes to us from, from these stories that, uh, that we need to make sure not to miss, that we, we might not have known already? Um. Coming at this as a historian of Nazi Germany, to me, it really casts the, the regime as um, a project in trying to create a homogenous fascist whole, that it's a fascist vision of people that look and act um, and behave the same ways. And in this hierarchy, there are some people who cannot be remediated right, they're Jews and there are these children who are defective and they must be exterminated. But in this hierarchy, there are also people that you can rehabilitate. And so there are different categories of worthiness and unworthiness. And um, in my book, I talk about the Nazi regime as a diagnosis regime. And it's this project of identifying with ever greater nuance different characteristics. And I think this is one of the reasons the autism diagnosis emerges from this period. It's looking for children with ever milder and milder defects that can then be labeled and dealt with. Yeah. So a, a diagnosis regime, um, if this is, if, if what we're seeing in this is the, the creation of homogeneity, the, the search for a fascist uh, singularity of human form, um, do you worry at all that 
some of this is still present in the way in which we approach human exceptionality, difference, autism itself, uh, disability? You know, I find that a fascinating question and um, it's something that I've wrestled with. How could a diagnosis that emerges in this collectivist vision, how are we living in a society today that theoretically celebrates diversity of all kinds and still look at our children with ever greater critical eyes? Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that the Asperger diagnosis um, really caught on in the 90s. And that was with the Ritalin generation and ADHD and really um, the entrance of school counselors and um, looking at our children in terms of milestones in a different way. Mm. Um, and so um, I would also say the Asperger's diagnosis is unusual because it replicates a kind of eugenicist hierarchy, right? When we look at the autism spectrum, people still use the term Asperger's even though the medically the condition doesn't exist anymore to differentiate between people who can be productive members of society, right? And then those with autism who are deemed yeah. more disabled. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, um, Edith, there's a lot of questions and they're good ones too. Um, I'm wondering if it would, would it be helpful if I shared a little bit of the of the American story here? Um, and Ari, I'm just going to take the liberty of suggesting maybe I'll I'll just for a few minutes share my screen if that's all right. If I don't hear from you, I'll, I'll think that's okay. Can I do that? Okay. So uh, just to compliment, um, uh, this is this is the American story, gang. Uh, I think sometimes we wish this uh, work was at uh, further distance from the American experience. This, uh, I'll just start here. This, this is a film that came out in 1916. Uh, this was championed by Dr. Harry Hazelton, who plays himself in the film. The film is the story of a doctor who helps women uh, counsel them so that they can allow their newborn children to die if they are born with uh, disabilities and includes scenes of denying the baby of care. And, and then finally, the exultant mothers who have been rid of their uh, children with disabilities. Uh, this film, the quote below is from uh, Columbia University, a sociologist, the idiotic child should mercifully be allowed to die. This is, um, it's worth noting also that during the Nuremberg trials, several uh, uh, defendants used the experience of the American uh, uh, institutions uh, as an explanation for and as a justification for uh, their behavior. So um, there was a, there is a painful, very painful link between the history that Edith just shared and our own history. Um, I'll, I'll just go very quickly uh, to a, a slightly personal example. This is the family of my mother. My mother is the person at the far left of this picture with her eight siblings and two parents as they headed off um, in, uh, in uh, before the war to, to the, the United Kingdom. My grandfather in the center there was named the ambassador. I don't share it for, for the rest of the people, but the person, the third from the left is my aunt Rosemary, who was born with an intellectual disability two years after. The Black Stork was a raging success as a, as a film. She was born in 1918. Uh, and in my view, it, it's, uh, it's either heroic or great chance or uh, love or some combination that uh, encouraged my grandparents to keep Rosemary. You can see her, she looks very much like her brothers and sisters there, to keep her at home and raise her with her brothers and sisters rather than sending her to an institution which many families, particularly wealthy families, would have chosen to do. To this day, I don't know exactly why they did so. But just to know that uh, this is the scene you'll find, and I used a picture from 1946, not 1926 uh, or 36, but these are post-war pictures. These, these are the result of the eugenics program in the United States. Uh, uh, this is the kind of care, if I can even use the word, uh, that was in effect authorized by the quote at the bottom, 19. Uh, 27, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, J Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote the opinion for the court, United States Supreme Court, in a case known as Buck v. Bell, 
that authorized the forced sterilization of uh, women, mostly with intellectual disabilities and institutions, on the uh, justification that three generations of imbeciles are enough. Uh, we have to cleanse the population of these defectives. Uh, they should not be allowed to procreate, and they should be sterilized. So this is 19. Uh, the 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 Buck v. Bell decision is in the late 1920s, uh, almost 10 years before Edith picks up the story. Uh, uh, it seems to me, at least, I don't know the exact history, but roughly uh, uh, well before the story gets picked up in Nazi Germany. I won't go through all this, but just to say that this is an old story. We see it in our uh, in our in some of the great Jewish texts. There are uh, there's this constant story that somehow we human beings uh, are prone to rejecting important parts of who we are. The stone the builders rejected. We see in the Psalms uh, and in Isaiah. Uh, the idea that the person we reject uh, is, a, is, is a part of us uh, and um, in some ways the key to our healing. I won't go through the story of my uh, Aunt Rosemary's life in great detail, but I'll just say these are just fun pictures. This is my Aunt Rosemary who had intellectual disability with my mother uh, when they were young and with her brother who later would become uh, President Kennedy when they were young. I won't go through the details here, but just to say uh, fast forward, this is the dental care for a person with intellectual disability in the United States. About 10 years ago, James Pierce was seen at the age of 40 uh, in, um, at a clinic in, uh, in the United States. Um, this poster, Retards, we all know one, uh, was photographed on the wall of the faculty lounge at a children's hospital in the United States about six years ago. Uh, so uh, this part of the reason I asked Edith about this lingering eugenic ident uh, mentality is that I think sometimes we don't even know it. We, in, in our work in Special Olympics, we launched a campaign some time ago just around the use of the word retard. As, uh, and people were actually, quite, you know, when we started at 80% of the people we polled rejected the idea that they should refrain from calling people retards. Uh, that shifted over time, thank goodness. But there's a certain sense in which, wait a minute, this is a population, after all, that we can and should and uh, ought to be able to humiliate, mock, exclude. Uh, they don't fit in. They're not smart enough. They, I don't want them hired. I don't want them in my neighborhood. I don't want them in my school. I don't want them in my child's school. I don't want them at my place of business. It is almost still, almost still acceptable speak this way and uh, the conditions are even worse this is the this is a photograph taken by a special olympics volunteer at a refugee camp uh, and you can see in the lower right hand corner of the screen uh, this is child care for a child with intellectual disability uh, he's chained every morning and the expression chained or tied is not uncommon in in places where there are no supports and where the stigma is still overwhelming uh, uh, this is Mal Malachi Niabukora, uh, who uh, actually the story ends quite well. I won't, I won't bore you with all the details here. So I just wanted to offer that, um, that sense in which the American narrative and the ascendance um, of a sort of a tyranny of uh, normality, a tyranny of intelligence, singularly defined as IQ type intelligence, the ascendance of uh, singular forms of success. Uh, if we calibrate success only in a very narrow band, I would argue uh, you end up finding situations where how can a child with Down syndrome or a child with autism or a child with Asperger's, if we still use that language, a child with Williams, a child with Prader-Willi, how can they possibly be a success in life? Uh, our definition of success will not allow them how can they possibly be productive at work? What we consider productive does not uh, accept the, the ways in which these children and, and then later adults contribute to the world. So I, I offer all that maybe back to you, Edith, and, and ask you um, how we can learn, how we can generate, how we can bring this knowledge to scale in our country and, and what it would mean uh, if, in our, if in the contemporary world, we actually took seriously the dignity uh, uh, and beauty and value of every life. I mean, are we, are we still a ways from that goal? 
Um, you know, I would say is the mother of a, a son who's been diagnosed with autism. We've had varied experiences. And I do want to say in the special education community, we've had some tremendous um, experiences. I feel like with the people at my son's school, he's not treated like a label at all. It really is an individualized education plan. They see him as him. Um, I'd say out in public media images, there is a homogenization going on and there are, you know, some of the things that you were showing about um, stereotypes that then get reflected. Um, but I, I would say it's a mixed picture. I, with my book, I was very gratified um, at how uncontroversial it was. Mm. When I wrote it, people were telling me, oh, be braced for blowback. Um, you know, not only minimizing Asperger's work, but not really taking the point about the eugenic hierarchy of how to label these children and, and who becomes worthy and who becomes unworthy and how we've replicated those labels in um, calling people with autism low functioning or mid functioning or high functioning. And in the discussion of my book, I see a lot of critique of these functioning labels now, right? And a lot of critique of the term Asperger. So I think raising these issues one by one, um, I think society's changing, I think yeah. in a lot of ways. And, you know, neurodiversity might be one of the final frontiers of this, but I think there's growing aware. Or what, what's your sense of this? Well, I think, no, I think it's, I think it's great that you point this out because I, I do, I, I'm not of the view that nothing changes. Um, uh, and uh, I think if you looked at, my mother died uh, a little over 10 years ago, um, a few years after my aunt Rosemary died. If you looked at the span of their life, roughly, uh, she, she would have been 100 uh, next month. Uh, that century has resulted in enormous change for people with intellectual and developmental challenges and differences in neurodiversity, even as you point out the term, is an enormous stride ahead of idiot, imbecile, moron. I mean, can you imagine these were medical terms, as you pointed out? So I think lots has changed. Um, and uh, I think the broader campaigns we are all in the midst of, of awakening to the ways in which we historically have humiliated, marginalized, even oppressed various groups, uh, identities, religions. I think that is a, is a good and healthy reckoning. My own view is it's a good and healthy reckoning. Um, and it will be made complete when we take the reckoning and the, and the awareness that you've taught us through your book and convert it into still more complete action and commitments to employment, to housing, to recreation, to education, to uh, full life, right? To full and, and complete uh, equality and dignity. So I think we're well on the way, um, but I think disability remains in most parts of the world still a very, very, very painful uh, uh, situation. Some of it brought on by the disabling conditions themselves, if I can even use that language. But still, most parents, when I ask them, uh, what's the biggest problem? It's, it's attitude. Uh, they rarely say it's their child. Um, they rarely say it's autism. Uh, although, you know, of course, many times it is, it, these, these conditions can create very painful certain circumstances. But almost everybody I talk to would still say, plea um, for people to see their children, their family members themselves, uh, as full, complete, whole people. Um, and that we're still on a journey in that regard. So let me ask you, can I, can I go back to the, the tapes? Um, one of the survivors uh, who spoke so poignantly about the fear of her body and so on, um, she said, I think at one point, how can I be angry? Uh, evil had no name. Can you share what 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 you think that means? What what that what what the message there is? Evil had no name. Um, she says at another point in the interview, it was just part of everyday life, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is an interesting perspective when we think about how. Um, these extermination programs were dealt with in the post-war period where it was very much about singling out the most culpable people and letting the hundreds and hundreds of people that enabled it 
who made it an everyday experience. The nurses were not charged. The, doc the transferring doctors were not charged. Um, but I think the children who were there saw perpetrators and everybody, right? And that was their experience. They were getting beaten by orderlies. Um, they were being deprived food by cooks. And um, it was just something that was endemic in how people saw these children. Um, mm -hmm. But what I think is fascinating about the experience then in the post-war period is to hold just a handful of major perpetrators accountable as that then exonerates society from an evil system that everyone's complicit in. Yeah, yeah. So a couple of questions, Edith, center on the very difficult issues around eugenics today and prenatal diagnosis. Um, uh, what do we do? One person asks about uh, genetic diseases that show up uh, in Jewish populations that are being screened for prenatally. Um, I think most estimates are that prenatal diagnoses of Down syndrome in the United States result in somewhere around a 90 plus percent termination rate. Uh, Denmark has almost go close to requiring, not quite there, but requiring uh, pregnancies be terminated when there are prenatal diagnoses. What's, how do we navigate, the, you know, outside the, you know, the, the cauldron of American politics, conservative and progressive ideas around choice and life? How do we navigate this just from the point of view of what we've learned about eugenics? Um, I'm gonna answer like an academic here, um, not, as a human being, but just, I think it's so important to call out what's happening, hmm. right? And label it. Um, I wanna apologize, I was using the Nazi term euthanasia, for example. And when you think about terminating, say a Downs pregnancy, there's almost a sense that you're doing it for the creature that would have to bear this life. Do you see what I'm saying? Like there, there's something in the language um, that's exonerating. And I think just to look at the cold, hard facts, like, no, that was not euthanasia. These children could have led full, healthy lives. And we need to define what's a full, healthy life, um, rather than from the perspective of the parent that has to deal with whatever that life becomes. I, um, so I, I'm not here to pass judgment or to share my personal views, but I just think um, labeling, looking at things cold and and hard facts. I mean, a, a child with Down syndrome can live a very full, healthy life. Yeah. Did this work? What are your thoughts about this? I mean, you're more immersed in this. I mean, I'm stuck in the past. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I think there's a chance to affirm the value of these lives that we haven't quite built yet. Uh, I think. Many people, for instance, uh, young folks, when they get pregnant and they hear Down syndrome, they, uh, they, there's a specter. Uh, there's a haunting, horrifying, negative uh, life that awaits them. Uh, the truth is actually almost invariably not that way. Uh, and so we don't really tell the story of the full life of a person with Down syndrome. We don't, those moms or those expectant parents don't hear that version. Whatever choice they decide to make, obviously that's a, both a political and a moral one, but I think from the point of view of people who advocate for and who love and who care about and who value the lives of people with, with special needs, it's important that we tell their stories so that people will see them. I mean, we had a, an event, uh, the Special Olympics movement had an event some years ago, about five, six years ago on Capitol Hill, a day when a lot of our athletes would go up to meet their congresspersons and senators and so on. And had a bunch all day meetings and people walking all over the Senate and the House in Washington, DC, and people have flown in, very exciting. And at the end of the day, we had a little reception. And at the end of the reception, there was a few comments and remarks and mem some members of Congress were there and then there was sort of an open mic. And one of the athletes who was there, Frank Stevens from Virginia came up and said, I, I have something to say. So he stood at the podium and, and he kind of in a halting way, he said, I, I, you know, I wanna say my life is worth living. And you know the room got quiet, uh, and I think it got quiet because we knew he was saying something controversial in the eyes of many people. Maybe not the people in the room, but maybe that's what he'd felt that day walking around the Capitol. You know, there's no statues in the Capitol of people with Down syndrome. You know, uh, there's no statues in the Capitol of 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 his community. 
And um, so I think we have to we have to just continue to tell the story that choosing life, if I can put it that way, that's my my own personal the choosing life um, is is something that the culture and the country and communities will support people in. And then, you know, obviously women and young couples or expecting couples have to believe they're going to get supported. Not enough to say, oh, you know, take it on. Good luck. Go bankrupt. You know, have stress for the rest of your life. Uh, but, you know, uh, many blessings upon you. That's, that's um, empty. So I think we have to build a culture and a country that uh, actually values the diversity of human experience. I mean, I always say to people, we'll know we hit it when you go to a magazine stand and you see on the cover, not just the beautiful starlets of Hollywood and the beautiful models of New York and the beautiful wealth of Silicon Valley and the beautiful brilliance of uh, artists and uh, other celebrities. But when you start to see our folks, not yet, hasn't happened yet to my knowledge. No, uh, other than dedicated journals have never, um, have never, have never done that. So yeah, I think we still have a ways to go, but I think we can tell the story better. Yeah. So let me ask you, but going back to not, I know you don't want to get too personal and you want to stay pretty academic and scholarly, which is fine. But what, uh, from the time you started researching this book to the time uh, you, sent those last galleys back. What changed in you? What, what, what changed? Um, this book was excruciating to write. Um, I had heard this, the tale of Asperger was a heroic one that he rescued children with disabilities. This was on his Wikipedia page. And so when I set out to write the book, it was gonna be a happy story. Um, the idea was that autism was kind of like a Schindler's list. He labeled kids with it in order to, yeah. Um, but from the very first file, I saw he was complicit in this killing system and that he would have killed my son. And that very quickly became personal. Um, and, you know, my son grew up with me doing this work. I worked on this book for seven years and we didn't use language of autism at home when he was young. Um, we talked about individual challenges he might have, um, but he came if I may share an anecdote, how he found out he had autism, he was in fourth grade and they were doing a disability day, which you might find ironic. And they had cartoon characters of different kids with disabilities. So there was a deaf kid and a blind kid. And, you know, guess what? There was a kid with trains <laughs> and, um, you know, with bullet points next to them with characteristics, right? And so the cartoon character version of disability is how my son came to realize he had that label. And he came home completely distraught. He'd never seen himself as a label before or caricatured before, right? And he wanted to have surgery to have it taken out of his brain. Mm. And um, anyway, but with writing this book, he saw a lot of empowerment in it. He actually wrote um, in the epilogue, he wanted to add his own voice. And he carried this book to school and showed it to all his teachers and um, was very proud of it. So you know, not to sound sappy, right? But this was a journey. Okay, sappy, it's okay. We can no, use this was that. a journey for both of us. And the argument became something I didn't know at the beginning, which is treat children as individuals, not as labels. And that labels can do more harm than good. And that's basically the, the message of the book. And that I, I am positive we are living in a society that's becoming ever more aware of difference. And I do think, you know, neurodiversity, disability is the final frontier of this, I hope. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about magazines. I hope we can get to school cartoons too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think textbooks and educational materials, there's a lot of talk in the chat about, uh, I'll just try to address it quickly. My aunt Rosemary, who I mentioned in the presentation and the fact that she had uh, an operation at George Washington University here in Washington, DC, uh, a prefrontal lobotomy when uh, my grandfather concluded based on medical advice that that was the best treatment. This was a treatment that was being offered to tens of thousands, primarily of women, largely for mood disorders um, and, uh, and, and sometimes for related kinds of conditions. Um, 
So uh, I treat the issue of the, just so people know that I'm not hiding from this, I have a, a book on this subject called Fully Alive, where I address what I believe was my grandfather's thinking. And, you know, there's a lot of different opinions on this. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity for people to uh, pick their uh, view on, uh, um, on my grandfather's decision. It was really his decision. Um, but I, I see no evidence that he did anything out of anything less than love for her. And uh, the horrific mistake that it turned out to be, I think, um, uh, wounded him for the rest of his life and um, resulted in, you know, and, and wounded Rosemary for the rest of her life. Uh, so there's nothing happy about the decision, but that's the way I read it. So just so people know, that's how I, uh, several people asked. Uh, and if you want a slightly more, uh, little bit more detailed treatment of the issue, it's in, in uh, that book, which is a couple years old, Fully Alive. Um, uh, Edith, what's, what's uh, you know, for people who are um, looking back, one of the great questions that always comes, you know, uh, Ari mentioned it in the chat also, what do we do with data we learned? It, or can, is, it, um, is it legitimate to, uh, to learn from, to benefit from, to uh, advance science based on uh, studies and data and that came from this period? Um, I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's a controversial um, thought, but I think whatever good can be had um, is good that can be had. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's not to say that you can, um, you know, I'm not justifying medical experiments, but um, my father, for example, was a heart surgeon that used journals on the hypothermia experiments in the North Sea to experiment with hypothermia to operate on um, premature children. Mm -hmm. So he saved lives with that. Mm -hmm. I can't argue against that. Um, so I don't know, what are your thoughts? I think, I, think, uh, I, I think any good that can come is good as long as it's very clear that there's no, there was no good in the decision to do the work that was done. I think everyone, we always worry that if we benefit from something that was horrific and um, uh, scandalous, that we will seem somehow to be condoning the horror or the scandal. And I, I think we can make those distinctions, but it, it requires sensitivity that Renee is asking me to stop judging. And I mean, I, I understand, I'm sure her point of view, and I'm, I apologize if what I said sounded judgmental. My, it's hard to talk about these things. These are very difficult subjects and there's a lot of, um, we can, I, I have put my foot in my mouth many times and for that I own responsibility and I apologize. Um, uh, it's, it's very, these are, these are very difficult issues. So um, I appreciate you, you bringing to us such scholarly and credible and fact-based wisdom and also bringing us your personal story. Uh, I think um, these, are, these are the moments in which we can see in, in the great complexity of the changes we're undergoing now as cultures, uh, a, a path forward so that we can be sound and, and, and true to the past, and uh, also be uh, sympathetic and understanding to people trying to chart a new and different future. And for, so for your contributions, I wanted to say thank you. I think we're pretty much close to out of time. I'll give you the last two minutes to, 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 to sh share your final thoughts, but I wanna say thank you and thanks to all those who joined and uh, let's keep these conversations going to the best of our ability. These are important conversations to have, even when sometimes as I've obviously done today, uh, we, we, make, uh, we say things that wound one another. Um, hopefully we can grow even beyond that. Yeah, I mean, I guess my concluding thoughts is these conversations are hard. Um, and Tim, I'm, I just want to echo what you're, but I think it's so important to have and to find a way to discuss it, right? And to put these things out in the open and be able to, to analyze them and, and yeah, um, have the frank conversations because that's, it's in the shadows where, you know, the lives of these children get hidden. Right. 
Tim and Edith, thank you both so much for spending your time with us today and sharing your insights and perspectives. Uh, I learned a lot listening to you and I know our audience did too. Um, we, uh, as a museum, like many Holocaust museums have not done enough over the years to properly tell the stories of people with disabilities um, during the Holocaust. So we are doing better um, uh, in recent exhibitions and upcoming exhibitions and, and we're glad to have you join us in that journey. Uh, we did record today's discussion and we'll email everyone in attendance tomorrow with a link to the recording, uh, a link to both Edith and, and Tim's books and some other resources. And Edith, I'll have to ask you for that link to the original testimonies of the Documentation Center in Vienna. So we'll, we'll include that as well. Um, we hope all of you will consider supporting the museum's work to preserve the, the stories and lessons of the Holocaust. Uh, you can do that at the link in the chat and joining us for upcoming events. I wanna specifically spotlight an event that we have on July 27th with Judy Human, uh, an amazing disability rights activist in the US who is Jewish and the uh, grandchild of, of uh, Holocaust victims and the daughter of Holocaust survivors. So we'll, we'll hear from Judy about her story next month uh, and the link to that is in, is in the Zoom chat. But um, thank you both again. And uh, we wish everyone uh, a good afternoon and that you continue to think about the lessons of the, the history that we dove into today.